educational program. Today, um, on this 16th of February, we're going to kind of cover a subject we had covered a few times for a little while, um, but we, we haven't talked about it a lot lately. So we're gonna recover um, the topic of invasive plants. So um, if you look on Hernando County Government YouTube, you will find a, a class called This Not That. And that was specifically native plants as alternative to problem invasive plants. So today we're doing This Not That Revisited. And I've kind of broadened um, your alternatives to not just native plants. And we'll, we'll get into that as well. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities. I work for the water department here in Hernando County. I work uh, with water conservation. So how does invasive plants fit in with water conservation? Um, well, invasive plants, one of the things they do is use up water resources that um, could be being used by our native plants or our Florida friendly plants. If you'd like to email me to ask any questions, um, my email is Lily B. L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. Um, or if you'd like a PDF copy of this program, um, after the program, just email me and I'll be glad to send you that. The program I utilize to uh, teach water conservation and um, sustainability in, in our Hernando County landscapes is this program here developed by the University of Florida which is Florida friendly landscaping. So everything I teach is always gonna be covering one or more of these nine principles. Um, there's a lot of people who help keep Florida friendly landscaping, the program um, going um, in our state. Uh, there's only a few of us who actually work for a water department, a, a municipality water department. I do, Stephen and Citrus County does, a um, few others in the county. But a lot of people who work for the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, that would be your extension office in your county. Florida Friendly Landscaping is always promoted there. And the Southwest Florida Water Management District is one of our biggest partners as well. So today, we're gonna cover principle number one, that right plant, right place. Um, we're gonna cover it kind of backwards. We're gonna discuss wrong plant, <laughs> wrong place, and then how to replace it with the right plant in the right place. So we need to go over some definitions, I think here, because some people get confused um, as to what we mean by what is an invasive plant. I'm not just referring to weeds because weeds could have many uh, definitions. A weed could be, usually the definition of a weed is a plant dealing with an unhappy person, meaning the plant is not necessarily in the wrong place. If it's a native uh, plant, but it's growing where we don't want it to be, it's growing in the right place, it's thriving there. But it is not an invasive plant, we may say, it's invasive to my flower bed. I don't want it to be there. Spanish needle is an example of a native uh, weed that likes to, you know, it's pretty aggressive. That is not what we're referring to when we're referring to an invasive plant. So let's talk about what is that. So, and this is from the uh, Florida. I've got some other windows here that you can't, <laughs> you can't see, and it's blocking my. Uh, my view, there I just blocked it entirely. Okay, there we go. Um, this is from the Florida Invasive Species Council. They used to be known as FLEPSI, Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. They are no longer operating under that name um, simply because the word exotic, they kind of kicked that word out because they decided it was confusing and they're trying to simplify things. And once in a great while, maybe a native plant can be an invasive species, not usually. So 
they it can be, you know, for the area that it's in, something like that. So they just went to a more simplified name, Florida Invasive Species Council. Then this is their definition. An invasive plant is a plant that has been introduced to an area from outside its native range, either purposefully or accidentally. Now, that doesn't mean all plants that have been <laughs> introduced are necessarily invasive, but they're just differentiating between native pioneering plants here and um, you know, plants that came from elsewhere and became invasive. A naturalized plant is one that can sustain itself outside of cultivation, outside of its native range. So, you know, we brought these plants in whenever, or they found their way here on ships or whatever, and they're growing by themselves. Nobody's planting them, nobody's cultivating them, they just start growing up places. That's what um, naturalized mean, but that doesn't mean it's become native just because it's made itself at home here. Um, an invasive plant is a naturalized plant that is expanding its range into natural areas and disrupting naturally occurring native plant areas. Hopefully that kind of clears things up a little bit for you. And then they uh, put them in different categories because some of these I'm gonna go over. You're gonna get mad at me by the end of the program. I know you are, because I'm gonna probably discuss some of your favorite plants and not necessarily the most favorable of lights. Um, but let's talk about the Florida Invasive Species Council. They still have category one and category two plants. They're more of a watchdog. Um, organization that really keeps their eye on these plants, goes out there, watches them, studies them, and then keeps notes and records. And so that when they really become out of control, then the next steps have to be taken for regulation of those plants. So a category one invasive plant would be plants that are altering native plant communities by displacing native plant species changing community structures or ecological functions or hybridizing with natives. We may think, who cares? You know, who cares if we evolve into different plants? Well, the pollinators and the animals um, that need those plants for survival, they certainly do care. Category two are plants that have increased in abundance or frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities to the extent shown by the category one species. The, the uh, keyword there is yet, and that's why the Florida um, Invasive Species Council, I have to relearn their name too, um, exists because they're like, we're watching you. We're watching you category twos. We are watching you because we're, we don't trust you. We think you're gonna become a category one pretty soon. Now, a lot of the category ones end up on the state of Florida noxious weed list. Some of them, some plants are so bad, they're on a federal noxious weed list, meaning they're just terrible everywhere, all across the country. Once they end up on those lists, the noxious weed list from the state or the federal government, then those plants are, you know, it's illegal to sell, purchase, or transport those plants. Some nurseries not, are not allowed to have them, um, not allowed to sell them. That doesn't mean, <coughs> They're not, obviously they're invasive. They can be found around. Unsuspecting neighbors may share them with each other. You may find them growing on the side of the road and think, ooh, what a pretty plant, pick it up. So it can still be spread. But that is going to answer your question. I already know that you're gonna have pretty soon when I discuss some of these plants and you're going to say, this is not my fault. Why is it in the store? Because until it hits that state noxious weed list or the federal noxious weed list, it can still be sold. So what I'm doing is making you aware of the plants that you may find in your, um, you know, in your nurseries, in your plant centers, but because they're not on the, it's illegal to sell these lists, 
So then the people still sell them, but you are gaining the knowledge that they're not the best plan to have around. So with that, let's get started. First one, you're gonna be mad at me already, I know. See, I'm already, I'm braced for you to be mad at me. So first, let me say a couple of things. I don't believe the universe ever created any ugly plants. I'm not saying these plants are ugly. A lot of them are beautiful. I'm not saying any of these plants are bad. Again, the universe did not create any bad plants, but they were put in where they're supposed to be in the world. The most inv invasive species of all were the ones who moved them around. And then they may end up in areas where um, checks and balances have not evolved yet. They don't get diseases. They don't have insects that keep them under control. Therefore, they just take off and go crazy. So, all right, are we ready to begin? Here we go. You ready to get mad at me right now? <laughs> Mandina, you might have it in your yard as we speak. Heavenly bamboo is another name for it. So a lot of people have this as a landscape plant and you may say it's so pretty and the berries and it, this one happens to be very dark green here, but a lot of them turn different kind of, you know, have reds in them. Well, before everyone gets mad at me, I'm just, I'm just the messenger. I did not make any of this up. <laughs> really, I'm getting it from the Florida um, ex Exotic Pest Council, as well as from the University of Florida, as well from many, many other sources. You can get mad at me and start Googling, and you're not going to find any different information, um, not from reputable sources anyway. So what's the problem with this heavenly bamboo? It starts growing on its own. And many of these plants that I show you, you're going to say, mine doesn't, mine doesn't do that. Mine stays right in my yard. Well, you see all these berries. Um, how many birds do you control from eating these berries? That's right, and do, where do the birds go? They go somewhere very, very far away and replant these seeds into these uh, natural areas. So, you, know, you, you don't see the damage that it's causing. And while we're talking about these berries, these berries, if you eat, an, if an, a bird eats enough of them, it builds up its toxicity. So one bird comes by, gets one berry, not that big a deal. But you have birds like cedar waxwings, which swoop down in groups and are voracious eaters, just ask the blueberry farmers. They come down and they just boom, eat everything. They eat so many of these that the toxins build up and they're actually poison to the birds. So if nothing else, you know, if you don't believe the exact, you know, the, yeah, it's um, invasive, which it is, but <laughs> if you don't believe that, think about the birds when you think about this heavenly bamboo as well. And this is from the University of Florida. This is their decision right there. It's not only invasive, it has no uses. <laughs> you know. So what can we do? First of all, how do we get rid of some of these invasive plants? I, um, you don't want to put them in your compost pile, grow more. I would suggest um, if they're very, very large that you um, take them to the landfill to dispose of them, put a tarp or some kind of blanket or something over them so you're not spreading the plant all the way from your house to the landfill. Or if it's smaller, you can break it up and throw it away with your household trash. How about some alternatives? Something better than that heavenly bamboo, which is not quite so heavenly. We here, I'm gonna first give you ideas of native alternatives which in our first series, that's all I did was native alternatives. This one, I'm also giving you non-native but Florida friendly alternatives. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to expand your palate a little bit further to avoid frustration. Because you may be so frustrated that you can't find some of these native plants or you know it's not as easy or something. And I don't want you to get frustrated and do nothing. So there are plenty of plants out there that um, 
are not native to this area, but they're what we call well-behaved exotic plants. They um, stay where they're supposed to stay and they don't spread themselves you know, everywhere else. Some great native alternatives to your Nandina, your heavenly bamboo, would be a fire bush. I'm trying to show things that give, have a certain similarity to some of these plants, if it's the look you know, that, that you like. Also, Yopan holly, <coughs> which has, and I am adding the Latin names, not to confuse you, but um, if you get the PDF from me later, email me and ask me, that'll help you in your search. Firebush is important if you want to make sure that you get the native firebush, you got to know the Latin name, which is Hemelia patens. Um, and now these do freeze back up here in Hernando County. A lot of our firebushes are really crispy <laughs> right now, but you know what? They come back every year too. And when I, uh, as I said, I'm giving you natives, I'm giving you non-natives. The natives are probably are going to be preferable. And here's why. Here's a couple reasons why. More natives you have, more pollinators, birds, more wildlife you're going to attract. That is just a given. And the other thing is these non-natives that I'm going to show you, I can't promise you in five years they won't be on that uh, uh, invasive list. Probably won't be, but you know, we don't know for sure. So you really got to keep an eye. Um, on these plants as well. So here's just some ideas, your native firebush, you know, your pretends. Yopon holly has one of my favorite uh, Latin names, Ilex vomitoria, because the leaves can be, uh, had been utilized by the native peoples as like a syrup of epicac kind of thing. Don't try it at home, I mean, they do make teas and stuff out of them. I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to encourage it. Um, you can also get a dwarf yopon holly. This one is, you know, a standard one. Gets pretty high. Dwarf ones are going to stay nice, round, you know, meatballs for you for a very, very long time, um, and stay maybe three feet tall. So here's a non-native. Florida friendly alternative, easy to find in your big box store. You could go there today and find one, I'm sure. Alora pedlum, also called a Chinese fringe, fringe bush, or Alora pedlum chinensis. This particular variety, how dark purple it is, is called plum delight. And that is the one that's most readily available. And it's going to have, um, I like it like this. I like it almost better when it's not blooming. The blooms are fine, they're nice little pink fringe flowers, but I really love the uh, dark purple color that this provides for you as well. Great, easy <laughs> replacement um, for your Nandina. Camphor trees, here's another one that people wanna fight with me about. Well, because if you already have one and it's this big, that's an expense. It's an expense to get rid of that and I understand that. Um, all of these plants I'm going to show you are category ones on the uh, Florida Exotic Species Council list, unless otherwise noted. Um, so camphor trees, you, you can't tell me you don't notice them trying in your yard to reproduce. You have camphor babies all over the place when you're mowing under them. Now this doesn't say it has no uses because obviously camphor has um, you know, a lot of medicinal use. Um, where it's supposed to grow, you know, they grow it as a product and they use, they use it for a lot of things. It grow, they grow large here. They grow large quickly here, which some people like. And I have been told on more than one occasion, you know, by people who have moved here, I don't even buy green bananas. I don't have 30 years <laughs> to wait for a tree, you know, to grow nice and big. So that's kind of why they like the camphor trees or else they already bought a property with it on it. And then I understand it's a big expense. But I said a key word back there. I said they grow quickly. Key phrase, I should say. Absolutely. A lot of trees that grow very quickly, that translates to a weak tree in a storm. 
So a lot of people end up having to get rid of their camper trees anyway, because they're breaking all over the place. And then they find out, oh my gosh, it was hollow inside. So I'm not going to say go out and spend a couple thousand dollars to try and get rid of it. But if you notice it's declining and it is time you know, to get rid of that tree, here are some much better options. Don't go get another camphor tree. Um, here's your native alternatives. A big, if you had a space large enough for that camphor tree, you probably have a space uh, large enough for a live oak. Unless that camphor tree was in too small of a space, then consider you know, putting something smaller there. So we have our land live oak, we have our sand live oak. They're cousins. Really, the, the, it's how they evolved in, in the different terrain that they're in. The say land, sand live oaks have two um, acorns. So you know if you have one, they're like, always like twin acorns together. And they're usually smaller than your Quercus virginiana. Um, not the one by my house, it's, it's pretty huge. Um, and a wing down. Uh, that would be a consideration if you really don't have live oak space. A wing down is going to be a smaller, more manageable, more urban friendly tree. Um, you know, more, more, more citified tree <laughs> knows how to behave in, in civilization more than the live oak. Um, and the Almus alata is a native. And it's just a tree, you'll plant it and you won't really ever have to worry about it again. And of course, them being natives, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of different um, wildlife species are gonna make their home um, in these trees. Most of them so tiny, you won't even notice, but it's very important to, you know, to our natural world. If you're thinking of a non-native, you can go to a Chinese elm. Um, had those, you know, up north probably too. That would be the Almus carvifolia. So there's an, um, you know, and that would be most, um, the way I'm thinking, there's a neighborhood uh, gated community here in our county that has a whole lot of camphor trees. And actually they're too big for the spaces. So if it's time to get rid of your camphor tree, consider one of these elm trees. Um, probably a lot better substitute for you. Here's another one, golden rain tree, and it is a category two. So they have, it hasn't been proven to be disrupting um, natural communities yet. But again, uh, the invasive species council is what? Um, a lot of people love these because it gives us a sense of fall color. We have these, it brings up these salmon colored bracts and these yellow leaves in there, and they grow quite large. Again, they grow quickly. What does that mean? Weak in a storm, so consider that. Um, this golden rain tree, a lot of people love them. They'll drive around in September, October, and be all like, oh my gosh, I want one of those. But they are an invasive species. And here's another thing I'm gonna tell you about them. Um, that might, it's kind of like the Nandina. I have something else to tell you that might change your mind about how much you love your golden rain tree. If you have one or your neighbor has one, have you ever associated the fact that every spring you get very, very upset with these little black and red little insects, thousands of them all around your sidewalk, in front of your house, all over the place? If you've never made that association before they're there, they're called Jadera bugs, J-A-D-E-R-A -E bugs. They're there eating the seeds of your golden rain tree. They're actually doing you a favor so that we don't have a golden rain tree forest um, everywhere that we go. That's why they're there. The only uh, sensible way to not have those bugs come every spring, not have the golden rain tree. Here's a nice native alternative, the Florida red maple. Not guaranteed to get that bright red every fall, but some falls it will. Um, Acerubrum, very, very nice native tree. And some non-natives, which might give you some of the, the same feel, 
Um, crepe myrtles, if you don't hat rack them and keep them small and let them, you know, you have the space to let them grow large. They come in many different colors and you can just let them grow and they'll give you that nice pop of color too for a lot longer time frame than uh, the golden rain trees. Tababuya, Tababuya. If you go um, to downtown Brooksville um, in the spring, there's a few in the parking lot across the street from the uh, government center or the, I guess it's mostly the, the uh, judicial center now. Um, these I say with caution because they're mostly a South Florida type of tree, but they're growing fine in downtown. I mean, it might be worth an experiment and you know, they have those beautiful yellow flowers. Something that's more of a large bush would be this Rialis and it'll have yellow flowers for you and the bushes can get 20 or so feet tall if you let them um, and they'll have those yellow flowers all year long and at least these two will be you know really easy for you to find as well okay um this one is more of a ground cover this inch plant uh, i found uh information on the university of florida's site the center for aquatic and invasive plants that this is not a problem in south florida that's unusual so if you <laughs> Are listening from South Florida, I guess what? There's there's a plant we have in Central and North Florida that becomes invasive, but that isn't a problem for you. Usually that's the other way around. So I guess um, your humidity and heat keeps it under control. It doesn't like that. We used to call this a wandering Jew in case you are wondering you know, what this is, that that's what it looks like. And so there are various uh, varieties of the Tradentia um, plants, now they call them inch plants. Um, it's really this flumensis, just the green with the white flowers that um, is becoming a problem. Some of the more hybridized versions like those purple queens and even the uh, variegated ones, I have not seen them on any lists. So if you have this, the older type, you might wanna consider pulling them up. This one you probably already have in your yard. So just let it take over. It's known by many names. Frog fruit, bog fruit, turkey tangle bog fruit, match head weed, many names. And the great thing about this is you probably already have it. So that also tells you, you know, the difference between a quote, quote weed. Sure, it's a weed, but it is a uh, weed that does not take over anything. It's, it's um, or doesn't disrupt communities. It attracts three different types of butterflies. You most likely already have it in your lawn. So just kind of put, you know, put somewhere your inch plant was um, and, and just let it, let it spread itself. It's a great type of ground cover. Some non-native, but Florida friendly alternatives are different types of jasmine that you can put in. And yes, jasmine can be a little aggressive, but you keep it in line with your weed eater where you want it to be, and it should do just fine. The Asiatic jasmine is gonna look just like this all year long, stay this dark green. It's not gonna have any flowers or any real aroma, but it'll keep an area covered very nice for you. The Confederate jasmine has that jasmine smell for you, which some people actually don't like. It's overwhelming for them. So then you might want to consider the Asiatic jasmine. If you're really looking for that, you know, that southern twinge of wonderful jasmine, then consider the Confederate jasmine as a ground cover instead. Okay, here, here's another, you're going to get mad at me again. I can feel you getting mad at me about the lantana. It's pretty. Sure is. It attracts butterflies. Absolutely. Yes, it does. But you drive around and you see it in natural woodlands where, you know, no human planted it there and you know it's being spread. It's the bane of ranchers because it can take over their um, pastures. 
the cows love it. It's like candy to them. So they, they eat it up. And then what do they do? Of course, then they replant it with fertilizer. Um, so then there's not enough of the nutritious, um, you know, hay of Bermuda, whatever type of grass it is that they want the cows to be eating you know, there. So, and also, like I said, you can find it taking over woodlands, uh, right of ways, sides of roads. I see it all the time. And sure, there are butterflies all over it. Just because a plant does one or two good things doesn't mean overall it's not disrupting the native plant communities. Just keep that in mind. So what can we do about that? There are actually lantanas. Lantana depressa is one of our native lantanas. Um, you can also consider, you know, something else. Coreopsis, which is tick seed, which is our state wildflower. You start planting that around and it's going to eventually start self-seeding and, you know, covering an area very nicely. You don't have to get the lanceolata. There's, there's several native types of um, you know, ecotypes that, and oh, the pollinators just love, just love those as well. Okay, a lot of non-native. Okay, before you think, Lily, have you lost your mind? <laughs> what, what are you, what are you doing here? Why are you trying to trick us? I didn't decide blanket flower was not a native plant. That wasn't my decision, but that decision has been made. Um, I always say poor Gallardia, poor blanket flower has been Plutoized. Just like Pluto was kicked off the planet team, our blanket flower has been kicked off the native plant team. I hear you, oh, you're so shocked because it has been decided. What is the definition of a native plant? They decided it's a plant that has been here in Florida prior to European, um, prior to Europeans coming over. So around about 1500. So they have done their studies and their uh, DNA testing and all that and decided at least the version we're used to, the ecotype we're used to with these big, beautiful faces. <laughs> we're not in Florida in 1500. So it got kicked off the native plant list. Fabulous plant. I felt sorry for it when it got kicked off the list, uh, and I've been buying it ever since. <laughs> Fabulous plant to have around, and a great substitution for lantana, and it'll self-seed as well. Okay, some of you might get mad at me now because you have asparagus fern in a pot on your front stoop, and you're going to say, how can it spread if it's in a spot? You know, well, again, look at those berries. Something's eating those berries and then going somewhere else and replanting them. Also, you know how sticky this asparagus fern is. So a squirrel or anything else that goes by and picks up some seeds, replants it somewhere else. And you know it's a category one, so it has been known to invade and disrupt um, natural plant communities. So what can we do about that? I love coon tea. <laughs> Coon tea is a wonderful native plant and pretty easy to find as well. That'd be a great um, alternative for you to even have a pot of it on your front stoop. Or you can go back to the same cousin, really, of the same plant, same kind of look, but it's the foxtail fern. It's the same, see, asparagus tensiflorus, and it's a subcategory called Myers. Um, this one is going to attract a lot more wildlife. Just remember the natives are gonna bring you a lot more pollinators and wildlife, but these Florida friendly non-natives are not, at least they're not gonna cause problems. So instead of the weeping asparagus fern, you can replace it with this cool looking foxtail fern that is, that is you know, not, not the troublemaker that its cousin is. The gustrum, these are everywhere, um, but they have been known to spread themselves you know, where no one ever put them and to be a category one problem 
plant, mostly in South Florida. So what can we do about that? We, they, we can get something in the same type of family, a privet family, that's a Florida privet, that is an alter, a native, or a wax myrtle, which is going to attract many different types of pollinators and birds and wonderful wildlife. And you can trim both of these into a hedge or into small trees, just like you can a ligustrum. Um, any holly. <laughs> Some of these hollies are native. Or that, you know, the Yopon hollies, the Dahoon hollies. Replace it with one of those, or even our non native hollies, American holly, Mary Nell, you know, Buford hollies. Any of those would make a very nice uh, substitute shrub and I think look even better. The gestrums, after a few years, they start looking really. You know, strung out or something. So these plants are just better alternatives all the way around. And here's one um, that I know this gets one of the, to be one of those pass along plants. The Vidalia, also called um, ox eye, creeping ox eye, creeping ox eye. <laughs> um, but you've seen them in ditches. You've seen this spread a lot of places. And what happens is a lot of people, you know, I know a lot of retired people, even otherwise, even not retired people, they see how easy this spreads and it fills in areas nicely and it's free. So let's just keep spreading it along. Everything I just said is a warning sign. <laughs> if any neighbor, friend, mother, <laughs> comes to you, father, you know, anyone and says, gosh, I just found this plant growing all on its own and you can't kill it and it's marvelous. Consider those red flags and, you know, be very judicious about the plants that you accept as pass along plants. Vidalia is one of those. But the good news is there's this beach sunflower Sometimes um, its cousin is called dune sunflower. They're both native. They both spread very nicely. They'll freeze back and come back, um, attract insects, and actually pretty easy to find, and will last all year long until they freeze, and then they'll come back. Um, and they love, absolutely love, the ruddiest soil that you have the sandiest, non-fertile looking soil that you have, they're gonna be the happiest there. Look at their name, beach sunflower, dune sunflower, where you think nothing wants to grow, this is happiest there. Black eye Susans too. Now they're more or less annual, so you won't have them as long, but it's gonna give you that great yellow, happy look that you're looking for as well. And then there's non-natives you can put there, Shasta daisies, any kind of daisy really, that's an annual, any kind of sunflower. Some sunflowers are native, uh, narrow leaf sunflower, swamp sunflower, that beach sunflower I just showed you. And then we, you know, you can get seeds or whatever and plant other types of sunflowers as well. If you just want that happy yellow face, there are many alternatives to find that. All right, this is gonna be our last one because this one, you're going to just shut this off and leave me <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, you can find this in the big box store. Yeah, maybe your builder built, put it in your yard, mine did, uh, this Mexican petunia. Yeah, maybe it's your favorite plant because you know it grows so nice and so easy. And maybe you say you have it in pots and you keep it under control. Nobody ever really does. <laughs> It, it, I have personally seen it in a undeveloped lot along a ditch line, filling up that ditch line. And where I lived at the time, I didn't know of any neighbors who had it. So how it got there, I don't know, but it did. Um, maybe from you know, birds, something like that. My builder um, put it in front of my garage 
um, when I bought the house. In, you know, just two little sections in front of the, you know, the wall that it is, isn't door, you know, just that little section there. Four years. Four years of digging those tubers out of that small section before this Ruelia simplex stopped coming back. Yes, it is an invasive plant, even if you love it, <laughs> even if it's beautiful. So what can we do to think of replacements? Some native replacements. If you're looking for that bluish purpley color, blue porter, porter weed, pay attention because there's many porter weeds that aren't native. So if you are insisting on the native, then make sure you get this Jamaica, the one with the, <laughs> looks like Jamaica in the Latin word there. It's more of a low grower. So don't think it, something's wrong with it <laughs> when it's growing lower. Butterflies, everything love this. Um, of course, you can get the other porter weeds as well that are not native, you know, as a substitute. But this one, as all natives are, are gonna give you a lot more wildlife. Purple coneflower, euthanasia, another, uh, no, it's going to be an annual, but another great pop of purple in your landscape. Some things to think about that aren't native, but are Florida friendly. Blue lily of the Nile, and that one's just going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. It's a great plant, sometimes called agapanthus. That's part of its uh, Latin name, agapanthus africanus. But blue lily of the Nile sounds a whole lot prettier. Any, any plant with the word lily in it, of course, it's gonna be beautiful. So I really like this plant and it's easy to take care of. And there are many, many, many different types of sages out there and a lot of them are blue. We have native sages that are more red, um, but there are so many other different types of sages out there that are, um, come in the blue colors. So that's why I just wrote blue sages. Look for those, you know, for that neat opportunity of either purple or blue in that color scheme. So I didn't go over too many plants because I didn't want to overwhelm you <laughs> too much, but some of the resources um, that I found the information, in case you thought I was making it up, are the you know, Florida Invasive Species Council that I told you about, and here's their website. So you can look up, they've got all kinds of great information there. And uh, the Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants is a University of Florida site. It can be a little overwhelming. I think the, um, you can find information there. You can be there for weeks looking at information. So, you know, if it starts to overwhelm you a little bit, look up go back to that uh, Florida Invasive Species Council, they kind of break it down more into layperson's terms. And also, if you want to uh, watch the first one of this series, go to Hernando County Government YouTube. Make sure you put the word government in there. I have a playlist, Florida Friendly Landscaping Playlist. Find that, I think it's kind of at the end of the playlists right now. And you'll see what I did during COVID and what I continue to do. So there's a whole long list of uh, programs you can watch on that, classes you can watch, but look for this, not that, the original of this, if you want more follow-up as well. And we still have classes going on all the time. So next Wednesday, same time, same place, right here on Zoom, spring into Florida friendly, land, I should say, Florida-friendly landscaping. So we're going to talk about a um, couple of things. We're going to talk about some of the spring wildflowers that you may run across and which ones plus others that you can incorporate into your landscape. A lot of them are those blues. There's the blue flowers of spring. <laughs> Something about blue really, uh, um, our spring brings us a lot of blue flowers. March 2nd, I think this has been much anticipated because I had to put it off and move it, but birdscaping, finally online. I've taught it twice in person to uh, some people. Didn't see you there. So make sure you watch it um, on, on the, the Zoom link. And then on the March 16th and 23rd, 
I'm going to pair up with Dr. Lester again from the County Extension Office. And we've been talking a lot about the different myths that we hear, especially on Facebook groups <laughs> and things like that about Florida gardening. So we decided there's enough. We're gonna actually make a part one and part two. So we're gonna find, you know, separate fact from fiction. In, in those classes regarding Florida gardening. And on April 6th, um, this is gonna kind of be a follow-up to what we talked about today. Dr. Lester told me he taught this at an in-person training. I spy something out of place, ways to identify and report possible invasive species. He said he taught this recently at an in-person training and he would like to teach it as an online class and I mean, well, heck yeah, if you want to teach a class of mine, uh, that's, let's work for me. Sure, let's do that. So on April 6th, you know, um, the Zoom link doesn't exist for that yet. So don't look at it. You're the first ones to hear about it. So don't look for it quite yet. Since it's his class, I told him to make the Zoom link and I will share it with you. So you, you get this, you know, special knowledge. You're the first ones to hear about that class coming up. And I haven't made the mythology ones yet too, but I should um, probably sometime this week. We also continue to have rain barrel and composting classes, two a month usually. Just had one yesterday. Um, so we're gonna have another one, an outdoors one at Delta Woods Park on February 26th, which is a Saturday. That is compost bins and rain barrels. Then an indoor one at County Extension, exactly like what we did yesterday uh, on March 8th. March 26th, another outdoor Saturday one at Ridge Manor Park for you folks over on the east side of the county. And then an indoor one on April 12th. We're putting together something fun for April 23rd, which is a Saturday. It will not only be compost bin and rain barrel workshop. Um, Dr. Lester and I are working on an Earth Day celebration, probably at the Master Gardener Nursery on Oliver Street in Brooksville. We will keep you updated on that. So there will be more than just that workshop. We're thinking about maybe a pollinator workshop, as well as an opportunity to purchase wonderful plants from the Master Gardener Nursery. So. I'm giving you all this insider knowledge um, today. Just um, keep you aware of what's coming up in the future. If you have any questions, uh, I'm sorry, I, I shut the class pretty well solid down because especially when I'm on my own, I have to be real careful of near do wells who might try to uh, you know, disrupt with some shenanigans. So I'm sorry that I can't interact with you a little better, but feel free to email me. Um, really the best way to contact me. If you are interested in one of those rain barrel workshops, that's where you start is um, by emailing me and I'll send you all of the information as well as if you have any questions about today. Dr. Lester and I also have every Thursday a virtual plant clinic. So if you look up Hernando Extensions Facebook page, I will share the link as well. Um, it'll give you the information of how to um, get on our virtual plant clinic every Thursday at 10 o'clock. Dr. Lester will not be there tomorrow. I'll be hosting it with, um, what I'll be doing is what I did a couple of weeks ago. I'm gonna crash the actual physical master gardener clinic where volunteer master gardener Bernie sits and answers questions in person. I'm going to crash that clinic and we're going to get on the virtual clinic and he's a big help um, to me to answer those questions because those questions all come in freestyle and we have to try and answer them off the top of our heads and we have a great time doing it as well so please you know, feel free to join us and that is everything I have for you today we got out just a little bit early but I know I gave you a lot of information, um, so mull this over in your mind. And again, this will be available on Facebook within a couple of hours and within a few days on Hernando County Government YouTube.
Thank you very much, everybody. And have a, a wonderful Florida-friendly day. <laughs>